Hi everybody and welcome. My name is Luke and this is The Science Lens where I show you how science can improve your critical thinking skills. In today's episode we're talking about the slippery slope fallacy. Who left this here? Now I'm going to start today by doing something very controversial. I'm going to question the wisdom of Master Yoda from Star Wars, but before you get upset, just watch this clip and let me explain. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. I sense much fear in you. In this clip, Yoda used slippery slope reasoning to predict Anakin Skywalker's eventual turn to the dark side, and while his prediction turned out to be correct, unfortunately his logic was flawed. The slippery slope fallacy is when someone uses a series of steps to go from one fairly mundane situation to a much more scary or absurd situation. So an example might be a student who forgot to do their homework and they thought to themselves, well, now I'm not going to pass the test, I'm going to fail the class, I'm not going to graduate and I'll never find a job. Here they started with a fairly common situation of not having done their homework and gone to a very far-fetched but scary situation of not being able to find a job. Understanding the slippery slope fallacy is important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because it's used all the time in politics, from debates about taxes to marriage rights, healthcare and drug laws. But it can also have an effect on our mental health if we catastrophize. I'll, I'll give you an example. A couple of months ago, I had this like pain in my neck. And even though I knew this was a terrible idea, I googled my symptoms. So after googling, I decided that I obviously had cancer, that it was incurable and that I only had months to live. But of course, when I went to see a doctor about it, it turned out I just pulled a muscle while exercising. If only I'd used my critical thinking skills, I could have saved myself a lot of anxiety. So let's see how we can overcome this fallacy using a thinking exercise. The first and simplest step for overcoming this fallacy is to watch out for phrases like, what's next? Or where will it end? Often when you hear these phrases, they'll be followed by a description of some scary but unlikely scenario. You should consider the available evidence. So if you've seen my video on the burden of proof, you'll know that if you're going to make a claim like not doing my homework is going to make me unemployed, you'd better have good evidence to support that claim. You should examine the assumptions that you're making. So for the homework example, that student is making assumptions like the homework's essential for passing the test or the teacher won't let them retake the test or maybe they won't be able to make up the class credit in some other way. And all of these assumptions need to be true in order to reach the final outcome. Finally, you should think about the probabilities involved. So let's say for argument's sake that there was a 50% chance that not doing the homework would result in this student failing the test. Then there's a 50% chance that this would lead to them failing the class and so on. So you can see that with each leap of logic, the probability of the final outcome becomes increasingly less likely. Now I'm aging myself a little bit here, but I have vivid memories from 1999 of the world becoming momentarily obsessed with something called the Y2K bug. Now the problem was that when software engineers were building the first computers, they had to conserve memory wherever they could. And one of the ways that they did that was by setting the date format on operating systems to only use two digits for the year. So rather than 1999, it would just read 99. The problem was when the calendar turned over to 2000, this would make the year 00, and nobody really knew what would happen if all of the computers thought that the year was 1900, but there was a strong possibility that they would all just shut down. Now without computers, banking systems would fail, electrical grids could switch off, and security systems at military bases could go offline. Now the Y2K bug was a real threat and could have had some pretty serious consequences, but some predictions of what would happen relied more on slippery slope thinking than others. Some people suggested that we wouldn't be able to fix the problem, that all of our important systems would shut down, that this would lead to your basic purge situation, which would lead to a Mad Max situation, and eventually the end of the world altogether. So let's use two of the steps from today's thinking exercise to look at the Y2K situation more critically. Consider the available evidence. So at the time, software engineers felt confident that they knew which systems were vulnerable and how to fix them. Governments and businesses invested billions of dollars to make sure that systems were upgraded, 
And while it's impossible to predict every problem, a heavy focus on things like nuclear weapons, electrical grids, water supplies, and so on, meant that a large-scale disaster was extremely unlikely. Examine the assumptions. In imagining a full doomsday, dogs and cats living together type situation, we need to make a number of assumptions, such as that we wouldn't be able to fix the bug, that any problems would be large scale, that governments would have no contingency plans, and finally, that anyone would ever make this guy the boss of water. Now, over the course of 1999, a lot of people would have at least entertained the thought that the Y2K bug could end the world. Everybody was at least a little bit anxious. But there's a big difference between the cautious concern that helped us solve the problem and the slippery slope logic that made some people think that the end of the world was a certainty. Well, that's it for today's video, but if you'd like some resources to help you practice the concepts that I covered today, you should check out my store on Teachers Pay Teachers. I've got a range of resources there for teaching critical thinking skills in the science classroom, and you can find the link to that down in the description below. Also, if you enjoyed today's video, please click the like button and subscribe if you'd like to see more videos on how science can help improve your critical thinking. I've also included in the description some links to other resources that I found helpful in putting together this video, so be sure to check them out for more information. For now though, that's it from me, thanks for watching.